why we can sing this morning. That's why we have cause for hope this morning. That's why we have cause for joy this morning. Not because of anything that we've done, not because of anything that we could do, but because of the work of Jesus Christ. That is our confidence. That is our anchor. 
is the unfailing work of Jesus Christ. We were made to sing. We were made to worship. We were made to lift our voices. That is why we are here. To praise the Lord with all that we have. I was made for adoration. I was made for adoration. I was made for adoration.
We thank you for the freedom that we have through the work of your spirit. Lord God, we thank you for the freedom that we have in you, Lord God. We thank you for the freedom from sin and death and the shame that once ensnared us, Lord God. May our lives, may our freedom from sin be used for your glory, Lord God. That is what it is all about, Lord God. Your glory, Lord God. That is where we find our greatest joy, our greatest satisfaction, our wholeness, our peace, when you are lifted up and glorified, Lord God. So, Lord God, we pray that you would continue to lead us into worship, Lord God. Continue to lead us to offer our bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to you, Lord God. Not just in this moment, not just in this room, in this building, Lord God, but in every area of our lives, Lord God. Call your people deeper and deeper into worship, Lord God. Call this nation into worship, God. Call this world into worship, Lord God. Lead us in the way we pray. Have your way in this service, Lord. Come by the presence of your spirit and do a great and mighty work in us. It's in the name of Jesus that we pray. And all God's people said, amen. amen. You can go ahead and greet one another. Good morning, Grace Family Church. It is so good, so good to see everybody greeting and hugging, greeting one another. My name is Lawrence. I am the director of Young Adults. And good morning, director of Young Adults and Technology. Um, if you're watching online, we're glad that you have chosen to connect with us this morning. And we hope that you will be able to join us in person next week or in the coming weeks. Uh, but I'm glad that you guys are here, that we're all here worshiping the Lord together. Amen. Amen. Uh, our first time guest, if you're a first time or you're a returning guest, we would love to get some coffee with you, as Esteban would say, some café con leche. Right? I said that right? Yes. Right? Or some tea and crumpets for our <laughs> British folks. But nonetheless, we would love to get with you, you know, just connect with you, get you plugged into our church, answer some questions that you may have for us. Um, you, we, uh, we will meet you right in Connect Central. That is through these double doors on the right side of the atrium. There's going to be a, a big, tall, green banner that says new here. You come on in, and we will love to have a conversation with you. A quick reminder, or two quick reminders, the first one being that we have daylight savings. Anybody excited about that? Okay. Those are my, those are my early risers, right? Um, but daylight savings begins next week on March 12th, so we're going to spring forward, all right? So if you show up, <laughs> if you didn't change your, 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 your clocks, all right, you're going to be in the middle of the sermon, all right? And we're not going to knock you down. But nonetheless, change your clocks because we are jumping forward next week. And our second reminder is our prime timers. Prime timers, y'all in the building? Yes, yes. So I, so I was thinking about this the other week. Prime timers is the place where all of your grandma's favorite recipes, right, all of those people gather in one place, I thought it was, a, it, it, it's a unique place for people to just come together and hang out. And I was like, I can't wait to be a prime time with myself. Because they eat good, all right? They eat so good, but they hang out, they have a good time together. And they are meeting uh, March 10th at 5.30 p.m. for a traditional St. Patrick's Day dinner of corned beef and cabbage. Man, eating good, man, I tell you. 
Uh, so this day falls on the on a carinet banquet. Uh, so there may be a smaller turnout, but that's okay. But please uh, uh, um, register RSVP through Mrs. Rose Smith or call the church office if you want to attend. Um, and as always, there are three ways to give, um, whether online, in person, or via text. And if you have given, whether online or any of those modes throughout this week, let us bring our offering to the Lord because he is good. Amen? He is so good. He provides for us in more ways than we can ever imagine. And this gift is just a small token of appreciation and gratitude for all that he does. So let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for all that you've done, Lord. All that you've provided, mainly through the Lord Jesus Christ. And that we are adopted into your kingdom, that we have been given every spiritual and heavenly blessings, Lord. And so we give out of gratitude. We give with joy. We give our first fruits. We bring it all together and say thank you. We thank you for who you are and what you've done. And we look forward to seeing you again and rejoicing with you and our brothers and sisters. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, Lawrence. Let's open our Bibles this morning to the first letter of Peter. We have been in this series for some time. We took a break for a couple months, but we've been back here now for a, a few weeks. And to kind of um, just recap a little bit, in the first part of the letter, Peter is, is telling these believers in Asia Minor, which is really modern-day Turkey, who they are in respect to their relationship with God. In verse 9 of chapter 2, he kind of sums that up, and he says, you are a chosen people. You are a royal priesthood. You are God's special possession. And then, as such, he gives them a, uh, a mission. And that is to declare the praises of this God who has saved you out of darkness into his marvelous light. And then he tells them basically how they were to declare the praises or the excellencies of God, most notably through the gospel of Jesus Christ. He tells them how to do that. First of all, he, he tells them, live out what you believe. That's the first thing. In other words, don't let your lifestyle contradict the message that you believe. In verse 11, he says to them, abstain from sinful desires that wage war against your souls. And then in verse 12, he says, live such good lives among the pagans or the unbelievers that though they erroneously accuse you of doing wrong, they will glorify God on the day that he visits us. And what he means by that is when the Lord returns, their hands are going to be up in the air worshiping because they have been converted, because they have believed, because they have been born again in part through the, inf through the influence of the lives that are lived by these very believers, because their lives matched their message. In other words, pre-evangelize with the way that you live. I say pre-evangelize because, well, nobody gets saved through the example of others. People can only get saved by believing the articulated message of the gospel. But more often than not, the right to be heard, sharing that gospel requires a lifestyle that matches that gospel. And if your lifestyle does match the gospel, Peter goes on to say, you may be accused of doing wrong, verse 12. In verse 19 and 20, you may experience unjust suffering for doing good, but you'll eventually earn the ears of the unbelievers in your life. You will earn the right for them to listen to you and to consider the claims of Jesus. So live out the gospel that you believe. And then he tells them, do that particularly in the context of three relationships that were very key in the ancient Roman Greco world. The relationship between the inhabitants of a nation and the governing authority over them. The relationship between slaves and masters. And the relationship between wives and husbands. That basically runs from verse 14, 13 of chapter 2 all the way through verse 7 of chapter 3. And so last week we took up the first relationship, the call for Christians to submit to human authority, particularly governing authority. And what we found out was this, is that basically the posture 
of Christians is to be not one of rebellion against authority, but submission to human authority, and that for the sake of Christ. Now, that does not mean that we should obey human authority when we are commanded to do something contrary to God's authority, to God's command. In that case, we submissively say, no, we have a higher authority, and we're going with him. We looked at several examples of that. Nor does this call to submit to governing authority mean that we cannot submissively and graciously speak out against social ills and cultural sins. We can and we should if we love our neighbor as ourselves. And furthermore, it does not mean that we should be uninvolved in politics, but rather that we should not trust in the political system to further the kingdom of God. But our overall posture, overall, Peter says, is to be one of submission to human authority. And so to that end, he writes, and I want to read the entire passage this morning so we can gain the context which we will need for where we're going this morning. So again in verse 13, submit yourselves for the Lord's sake to every human authority, whether to the emperor as the supreme authority or to governors who are sent by him to punish those who do wrong and to commend those who do right. For it is God's will that by doing good you should silence the ignorant talk of foolish people. Live as free people. But do not use your freedom as a cover-up for evil. Live as God's slaves. Show proper respect to everyone. Love the family of believers. Fear God. Honor the emperor. Slaves, in reverent fear of God, submit yourselves to your masters, not only to those who are good and considerate, but also to those who are harsh. For it is commendable if someone bears up under the pain of unjust suffering because they are conscious of God. But how is it to your credit if you receive a beating for doing wrong and endure it? But if you suffer for doing good and endure it, this is commendable before God. To this you were called. Because Christ suffered for you, leaving you an example that you should follow in his steps. He committed no sin, and no deceit was found in his mouth. When they hurled their insults at him, he did not retaliate. When he suffered, he made no threats. Instead, he entrusted himself to him who judges justly. He himself bore our sins in his body on the cross, so that we might die to sins and live for righteousness. By his wounds you have been healed. For you were like sheep going astray, but now you have returned to the shepherd and overseer of your souls. Wives, in the same way, for the Lord's sake, submit yourselves to your own husbands, so that if any of them do not believe the word, they may be won over without words by the behavior of their wives when they see the purity and reverence of your life. So, what we have here are three relationships in which believers are called to live out the chief value of Christianity, and that is humility. Common to all three of these relationships is the command to do good by submitting to human authority, even though at times it may produce unjust suffering. The three verses in question are at, at point here are this. Verse 13, submit yourselves for the Lord's sake to every human authority. Verse 18, slaves in reverent fear of God, submit yourself to your masters. And verse 1 of chapter 3, wives, submit yourselves to your own husbands. And then inserted within these three sections is another section, a fourth, the ultimate example of submitting by Jesus Christ, who perfectly submitted to God, submitted to human authority, and also submitted to unjust human authority. Now, when Peter says, submit yourselves to every human authority, slaves submit yourself to your masters, and wives submit yourself to your husbands, most postmodern people just go AWOL. <laughs> I mean, to them, these verses validate oppressive govern governing regimes. They condone slavery, and they uphold misogyny. And they think this way in part because they lack 
both the theological and the historical context to understand these verses. They are much like the Romans we talked about last week, who accused first century Christians of cannibalism because they partook of the Lord's table. They took the bread and the juice, and so they called them cannibals because of that. Why? Because they didn't understand the theological context of it of all, nor did they want to. Furthermore, the ancients or the moderns refuse to understand that God does not always solve problems created by human sin the way we think he should. History shows that in the first century, Christian women enjoyed a much higher status within the Christian subculture than pagan women did throughout the world where they, for the most part, were treated horribly. History demonstrates that slavery came to an end early within the Christian subculture because of the message of the gospel. See, Christianity did not seek to change the status of women or slaves by protesting or by rebelling against the established authorities, but rather by changing the status of women and slaves within the Christian community itself. And this caused Christianity to flourish among those two groups and led to a great growth in the church where the church became a dominant force in culture, which in turn then affected everyone's attitude towards women and towards slaves. It led to changes throughout the entire world. Now, most believers can come to understand the wisdom of citizens submitting to governing authority and and wives submitting to their own husbands. But the call for slaves in the ancient world to submit to their masters is troubling. Some translations have even tried to soften this a bit by translating slave in verse 18 as household servants. And that's not a bad translation, I may add, because the Greek word here is not the normal word for slave, which is doulos, nor is it the word for servant, diakonos, but it is the word for household servant, oiketes. But it turns out, really, that there's really not a lot of difference between these three words. They were used interchangeably in Greek culture. Doulos emphasized the nature of a slave. Diakonos emphasized the function, serving. And oiketes emphasized the location where that serving was done, mostly in household. So any way you slice this, this is, this is talking about slavery, not just serving. And so obviously a lot of pastors, they sidestep this passage. And uh, they kind of present over simplistic explanations and quickly move on to, the, uh, to applying the slave-master relationship to the more modern employee-employer relationship that we have today. And while that is a proper application, it really doesn't fully deal with the issue of what these verses say about slavery, which is what I will humbly attempt to do this morning. Boy, that will not allow me the time to make the application to the employer-employee relationship. And that's a very important one in your Christian witness. Your work, how you work, your attitude towards your employer, everything about the way that you work speaks volumes about how deeply you believe the gospel. But that's a sermon for another day. So my approach to this this passage this morning is going to be first to look at some historical background because it's really required here in order to properly understand this and also some theological background to provide some some context. And then after that, what we're going to discover is that these verses and others like them in the New Testament really became the spark that lit the fire that ultimately ended historical slavery and elevated the status of women through what I'd like to call the submissive subversion of believers in Jesus Christ. Submissive subversion. Christianity didn't change the world like a tidal wave coming up against things. It eroded sinful structures in society from underneath. And we'll see that as we go through the, uh, the, the passage this morning. 
So, a little history first. In the ancient world, people were enslaved primarily for four reasons. They were prisoners of war, number one, or number two, they were being punished for a crime. Number three, they inherited the status from their parents, or number four, they actually put themselves into slavery because of poverty or they were trying to pay off a, a debt. And evidence of slavery dates all the way back to the Sumerians, the first civilization that we have record of, 5500 B.C. And um, it continued until 1750 when Hammurabi of the old Babylonian Empire established the first code of ethic or law concerning the treatment of slaves. Slavery continued after that to be practiced nearly in all civilizations who came after. The Egyptians, who among many others enslaved the Israelites. The Assyrians, after that the Babylonians, after that the Persians, after that the Greeks. In 400 BC, half of the population of Athens was made up of slaves. It was just a part of their culture. So much so that even the great philosophers like Socrates and Plato and Aristotle didn't even say a word about it. They didn't even speak against it. It was just so much a part of their culture. In 64 AD, when Peter wrote this letter, slaves made up nearly the entire workforce in the Roman Empire. And this was the world that Christianity was born into. It's when it began. In many ways... It was very different from today, and understanding that is very important in interpreting this passage of Scripture. Slavery was a part of the social fabric of all societies. In the Roman world, there were two kinds. There were chattel slavery, and then the more common indentured servitude slavery, which was not race-based or seldom lifelong. In this kind of slavery, education was encouraged. In fact, some slaves were better educated than their owners and worked as doctors and teachers and government administrators. Some slaves were entitled to own property, including other slaves. And they could publicly assemble. And they could, although it was very difficult, even purchase their freedom. But regardless of what kind of slavery it was, you were still considered property and not free. But in most of human history, chattel slavery was the more common. And it became even more so after the Romans fell. Around 600 AD, Muslims from Medina started conquering the world. First thing they did is they enslaved the Byzantines to the north, and then they enslaved the Berbers and the Nubians to the west, which was basically all of northern Africa. Under Islam, it was illegal to uh, enslave a Muslim. So many of these peoples that were taken over were uh, converted to Islam so they wouldn't become slaves. And this is how Islam grew so quickly. By 800 AD, the Vikings were getting rich off slavery, capturing Anglo-Saxons from England, Celts from Ireland, and Slavs from the Baltic, selling them in giant slave markets all the way across Europe and the Middle East. The Slavs, of course, were the people group from where the word slave is derived because such a large number were captured by the Arabs from Spain. Ironically, 300 years earlier, it was these very same Slavs who were making slaves out of the Greeks. So, by 1200, we have the trans-Saharan Arab slave trade, which began when Muslims enslaved nearly 3.5 million North Americans. In the 1300s, the Ottoman Empire began enslaving Europeans. Forcibly, uh, forcibly converting them to Islam and then uh, making them fight in their armies. By 1400, Genoa and Venice, Italy, were in competition with one another to become the most profitable slave trade market for slaves out of Crimea. During the 1500s, then, North Africans captured one million European Christians in the Barbary Coast slave trade. Then, in the 1600s, the transatlantic slave trade began, the one most everybody is familiar with. Western Europeans took textiles and metals and weapons to Western Africa to trade for slaves who had been abducted by more powerful African tribes who then were transported to Brazil or the Caribbean or eventually the United States 
exchanged for sugar, which was brought back and made the Europeans rich. This handed, uh, continued until these movements were legally abolished, 1786 in England, 1848 in France, 1865 in the U.S. through the 13th Amendment, 1888 in Brazil, 1910 in China. But slavery continued. It didn't stop in the 1930s with the creation of the Gulag administration in Russia, which enslaved 7 million men. And the forced labor camps, much like the Nazis did with the Jews, 6 million Jews around the same time. Likewise, the Japanese enslaved millions of Chinese, and the Chinese still have re-education camps for the Uyghurs. And North Korea currently enslaves over a million of its own people. In fact, in 2021, there were over 50 million slaves, more than ever at any time in history. 21 million in forced labor. 3.3 of those, 3.3 million of those are children. 22 million in forced marriages. And 6.3 million in the commercial sex trade. 70% of all slaves in the world 